Right, good. Let's get started. So I'll be the rest of your entertainment for the afternoon. Um, the next two somehow for us. Um, let's start with a uh, collection paper as well. Um, so here we looked into diagnostic decision support and uh, in particular how to find difficult cases for doing this. Um, so one key problem that, um, that clinical decision support often runs into are uh, diagnostic errors. Uh, and by the definition, diagnostic errors are the failure to correctly explain the patient's health problems. So the symptoms the patient presents with a certain set of symptoms and you want to know what really is the diagnosis here. Uh, but also if you don't do this in time, we count this as an error. Right? So if you take many terms and you, uh, you get this wrong three times or you spend a year and eventually get there, we consider this a diagnostic error. And then interestingly, and this is something that we often don't pick up on, also the failure to communicate and explain that to the patient, that's also an error. Right? So even if you as the, the medical professional get it right and the patient doesn't understand this and will therefore not be able to react appropriately on it, um, that also is a, is a diagnostic error. Now, um, these things are really interesting because they are very early in the patient pipeline, right, or the, in the pipeline um, of your, your medical journey. So if you get the diagnosis wrong, probably the treatment will also not be useful for you afterwards. Now, um, as a consequence, we see that among all clinical errors or so mistreatments and other consequences that you can have there, 40% uh, are diagnostic errors. 10% um, of all patient deaths that we see in the medical system are related to diagnostic errors. 22% um, of healthcare spending, so this is the US number, but it sort of translates to the rest of the first world, um, are attributed to diagnostic errors, and that's in the US uh, an annual amount of several hundred billion dollars. Um, and the other figure is on average everyone gets misdiagnosed at least once in their lives. So, what do we do about that? Um, there are a lot of diagnostic decision support systems out there that try to help um, physicians get the right information at the right time so that they don't have to make this hard um, decision of which out of the 30 to 40,000 diseases that we're aware of um, this patient might have. Now, um, this can come in different flavors. Um, the typical ones are either machine learning or IR based systems. So these are either retrieval or prediction tasks. Right? So uh, this can be predict a label or retrieve related information. Related information often comes in the form of literature, of guidelines, of historic patient cases for whom we know what they eventually were diagnosed with or what treatment they responded well to. Um, or these could be clinical trials, right? So those are the typical things. Um, you may have other sources of information that you are interested in. Now, there are a bunch of collections out there that already are being used to evaluate and train such diagnostic decision support systems. Um, so now the question is why do we need another one? Uh, if we look at these, so, so the, uh, um, the uh, clinical decision support track from TREC, uh, Play eHealth, Mimic, I2B2, and then there are a bunch of others, they all give you patient-related information and they want you to tie that to some form of documents that, uh, that we might care about. Um, however, all of these collections either start from, because actual patient data is very privacy sensitive, so we don't like to give that out to you, so uh, many of these collections actually made up patients. Right? So we have doctors and they describe, oh, your typical congestive heart failure patient looks like this, and they'll just make up a patient record, uh, and that's the, the synthetic data set on which you're working. So that's not ideal. Um, if we have real data, typically it comes from intensive care settings which again is not ideal uh, for the reason that uh, in intensive care you'll see a very narrow range of diseases. So you'll only see the, virtually only see the heavy hitters. So if you see your congestive heart failure, you see the diabetes, uh, you see grandma that falls off the ladder and breaks his hips. Um, so it's these kinds of things, but really um, the things that doctors often struggle with, the rare stuff, the weird case where someone had two diseases that together look like nothing, like either of those two, um, those things will hardly ever be in there just because they live in the tail of the distribution. So you may have one strange case in there, but the vast majority uh, of the stuff that all of these papers, so if you look at the 
uh, in the popular science, the big newspaper announcements of whichever company is now how good at predicting these five diseases, but they're looking at five diseases for which you have many, many examples. Right? So the, uh, the hard challenge, I believe, is to, to deal with the tail, right? With sort of the rest of uh, the outcome. All right, so how did we do this differently? So instead of using patient records, um, we started out with case reports. Um, so medical journals, um, so we work with the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, which is one of them, but there are many of them, and they often put puzzles for their readers. So these are action cases that uh, that's one of the readers um, encountered. Um, and they'll describe the case in detail, um, with all the notes that the physicians went through, and then they'll leave it up to the community to follow what might be the right diagnosis. So people then typically have four to eight weeks to puzzle on these web pages and say, oh, I believe it could be this, and then the colleague from Massachusetts says, oh, I guess it's something else. Right? So we have this back and forth, and then eventually they unveil uh, what strange rare disease or strange presentation of an uh, otherwise known disease this was. So we worked off these uh, published cases. Um, each case here, so they are complex, so each of them has between 6 or 25 notes, right? so terms in which physicians run the test and report results. Um, for each case, we have the eventual uh, confirmed diagnosis, so we know for sure what they actually had. Um, and what we did was we uh, had a physician go through this and manually encode ULS concept IDs for all of these diagnoses. So many cases will have more than one diagnosis. Um, so you see the, the simplest case here, if you consider that circle, has one diagnosis and there's one poor person in here who has 29 correct diagnoses that together constitute this, this rather complex patient picture. Um, that we are dealing with here. Um, and then finally, um, as the, the last piece uh, to this data set, we also went through PubMed, which um, the recent snapshot of this has 28 and a bit million documents. Um, and we used these, uh, these CUIs here and inferred dense relevant judgments. So what we do here is we say, if a document matches, contains at least one of these CUIs here, we consider that relevant. So it's, it might be a relevant clue for a physician reading this thing uh, in diagnosis. Um, just as an example, so this is case 6, for example, of our data set. Uh, so at day 1, a 29-year-old 20, male presents with diarrhea and weight loss. Um, and on day 1 also, um, he discusses his medical history um, and history of symptoms with the physician. And there's a general physical exam. Okay. Um, just the next day, uh, we perform a bunch of lab tests, blood count, and so on, uh, as well as an ultrasound. And then three weeks later, gastroenterology uh, results and as well as the results of a genetic screening campaign. So this is a rather simple case. So number six was, uh, uh, this one here has seven nodes. I guess six was the shortest case that we had. Some of them with 29 such episodes. And they are full text. Right? So um, if you consider these things queries, as we will in a moment, it's a long query if you have 29 paragraphs of text that make up one patient case. All right. Um, so this case here, for example, led to a diagnosis of Wilson's disease, which, as my authentically informed collaborators tell me, means that you are building copper in your body. Uh, and that makes not just all your organs fail, but also makes you hallucinate and go insane. Um, so rather nasty thing to have. Um, we are sharing the data set in uh, just XML format, so you'll see that you have all the different nodes, you have to see that this leads to um, Okay, so um, as a benchmark, we tried out uh, very naive approaches at two different tasks with this data set. So the first one is our classification task where we try to predict ICD codes. So given the text of the, of the physician notes, the diagram, can we predict the diagnoses basically for this patient? Um, and what we do here is uh, we train uh, class conditional models on PubMed abstracts that deal with these different diseases. Um, we take care of those because in the real world you wouldn't really know which one is the right one, right? so that's what you want to find out. Um, and then we classify these patient cases and we are looking at how this performance uh, changed as we increase the pool size. And just keep in mind, so we are going from 500 up to 2,000 diseases. Uh, the numbers you see here are averages over a bunch of randomizations. Um, in reality, 40,000 is the target number, so that's the, the amount of, uh, of diseases that we are aware of. 
right? So you can already see that this doesn't perform too well uh, using relatively simplistic models here. So clearly you can do a lot better, but just to give you a ball on a figure of how uh, hard this is with 2,000 diseases, uh, we're not fantastically good at doing this. Um, and then uh, there's a retrieval experiment as well, where we basically mimic the, uh, the same setting of the track clinical decision support track, but with these queries here. Um, so again, uh, your patient case is your extremely long query. Um, and if you just pump that into a uh, tfi of model, a lambda mark model, or a neural network model, um, you get relatively good um, performance scores, but keep in mind, this is this very optimistic model of a physician that just reads a document mentioning the symptom uh, would pick up on that this might be the correct diagnosis for the patient, which in truth will probably not be quite as easy. All right. Um, this is the URL for the data set. Try it out, download it, play around with it. I think there's a lot in it that we probably also didn't play around with it yet. Um, if you have more questions, concerns, or anything else regarding this, we're kind of a screaming red paper poster over there. Uh, I'm happy 